Excellent. Okay. Well, great. Well, welcome, everybody. Hopefully, you can hear us okay and see the screen, as I've already mentioned a couple of times, but for those of you that are just joining us, we will have, we'll be presenting a PowerPoint presentation today that will complement both of our guest speakers, who I'll introduce shortly. First, I just want to say thank you so much for joining us as we are extremely excited uh, to present to you on the evolving updates around the cannabis industry as a whole, and more specifically how jurisdictions like yours can now manage this legal consumption in many parts of the U.S. We will begin our discussion by providing updates on the state of the industry itself. We will begin by discussing national trends while also diving into specific state-by-state -state updates that will provide clarity around different industries that are being affected and how you can navigate these key issues. Next, we'll look at a pioneering state in California and some of the after effects of early adoption and regulation. And lastly, we will provide takeaways for developing your own cannabis program and steps on implementation. But first, our presentation today is going to be roughly 35 to 45 minutes, give or take. It'll be conversational style. Uh, we'll have a couple guest speakers that I'll introduce to you very, very shortly. Um, very thankful for their time, very thankful for them and, and the insight that they'll hopefully provide today. Um, we'll, we will follow the presentation with a 10 to 15 minute question and answer period that I highly recommend you take advantage of and you wait around for. Um, we'll be answering those questions live. You can submit those questions um, right here in WebEx. Uh, in the chat feature, or you can submit those directly to webinars at avenueinsights.com, and we've got a team standing by that will facilitate those questions, and we'll get those answered for you as soon as possible. So first, my name is Brennan Middleton. Um, I'm part of the marketing and client services team here at Avenue Insights and Analytics. I'll be your host and moderator. Um, I'll also be responsible for uh, facilitating those questions you may have and making sure that our presenters are clearly articulating the answers back to you and if we run out of time today, we'll make sure we follow up with you individually. Next, I'd like to introduce, introduce to you both of our presenters. Um, first, Avenue Vice President of Government Relations, Fran Mancia. Fran leads Avenue's lobbying efforts related to legislation, state mandates, and regulatory policies that affect client revenue streams. He brings a strong working knowledge of local government general fund tax laws and state and federal regulatory and legislative issues. Fran serves as a member of the Board of Regents of the University of California, overseeing all 10 campuses, as well as its teaching hospitals, medical centers, laboratories, and hundreds of other facilities and programs. He also serves on the, on the League of California Cities Revenue and Taxation Policy Committee. So, Fran, thanks for joining us. Next, Larry Bergkamp, Avenue's Senior Technical Cannabis Advisor. Larry brings over 10 years' experience working directly with local government. Prior to joining Avenue, he served for over 28 years with the California State Board of Equalization, including working for the SBOE on medical cannabis issues since 2003. Larry was recognized as the leading medical cannabis expert at the agency until his retirement from the SBOE in 2015. He was involved in the initial registration of medical cannabis dispensaries for sales and use tax purposes. So, Larry, thanks for joining us today. So first, our agenda, um, just to give you an overview, as I previously mentioned, we'll, we'll dive, dive into a quick overview of Avenue Insights and Analytics and our core mission and how that is, to, is aimed at serving state and local governments across the nation at the highest level. We'll begin our discussion by providing updates on the, the state of the cannabis industry itself while we discuss national trends uh, and also diving into specific state-by-state -state updates that will provide clarity around different industries that are being affected and how you specifically can navigate those key issues. We will then look at a pioneering state in California and some of the ongoing effects of early adoption and regulation. And lastly, we'll provide takeaways for developing your own cannabis program and specific steps you can take on implementation. Again, that question and answer period will be at the end and you can submit those along the way. All right, so who is Avenue Insights and Analytics? Uh, while partnering with over 3,000 government agencies nationwide, uh, we aim and work with state and local officials to deliver software and services that boost revenue, optimize operations, and in all deep in community trust. Our solutions for administration and revenue enhancement enable jurisdictions to provide a truly digital government that meets expectations of the citizens, the employees, and the elected officials. So, Fran. 
cannabis regulation appears fragmented with different states and different stages of maturation. Let's begin by talking a little bit about this on a national and regional scale. Well, first of all, thank you, uh, Brendan, for hosting this webinar, and it's a pleasure to be a part of this um, conversation today. We certainly want to be a resource for all of those, those of you who are joining us today. Um, by way of background, you know, Muni Services is also a name that might be recognized in California and other states. Uh, it's a pleasure to have Muni Services as a part of the Avenue family. A lot of uh, people who have been a part of Muni Services for many, many years are still very much involved in, their, in our work together, and uh, it's a pleasure to be a part of a, a combined company that provides a lot of great resources, including work in this area. And just by way of background, several years ago we got very involved in the cannabis space as a request from clients who in California where medicinal marijuana was legalized. Um, how do, we were first involved helping with auditing of cannabis dispensaries. We were the first company to do that. Um, we were doing that for many, many large jurisdictions throughout the state and, and we'll be doing more so in other states as well. So our first foray into this became a, a, as a request of clients and from doing audits we've also become very involved in helping cities shape their programs and how they address this issue, whether they allow can, cannabis operations in their community or, or not. And I think it kind of goes to the slide that's before us. Attitudes towards the usage of cannabis have clearly changed in the country um, quite, quite dramatically in the most recent years. Um, I think people are more receptive to medicinal consumption and usage of, med of medical products as well as recreational. Um, I think you're going to continue to see a more openness towards it. And in a moment, we're going to go to a map that kind of illustrates that very point. Um, in terms of the value, it's really difficult to, to quantify the value of the cannabis industry, but it's clear it's growing and it will continue to grow in the coming years as more and more states open up and allow uh, commerce and, and cannabis to take place in their states. But current, due to current law, activity is limited to within a given state. You cannot have any cross, uh, you cannot cross state lines with the activity that you may perform in the state. So it really is uh, state by state um, at this current time. Also, the federal regulations are restrictive uh, towards banking and the ability to use banking. A lot of this is still very much a cash-based business because of potential conflicts with federal law. And cannabis is still considered a class one drug um, by the federal government. Whether that will change in the near future, it's likely we'll see changes in the coming forward, but as of today, that there are those limitations in place. Um, I mean, I think more and more we're going to see a shift uh, towards, uh, I think, a relax, uh, relaxation of those rules. So maybe, um, so maybe we can go to the next slide and we can look at the state map. As you can see here, this map today looks very different from what it was five years ago, and I think it's even more so in five years it's going to look very different from what you see today. Um, what this basically illustrates is the, the darker colors states such as California, Nevada, Oregon, Washington, Maine, Michigan, are allowing medical and recreational sales consumption and use of uh, medicinal products. Uh, the dark green that you see is, is medicinal only, so you can see that in places such as um, Oklahoma, Arizona, Utah, places of that type. And the light green allows CBD, low THC products, so that may have a be medical benefit, but without the THC, which provides the stimulation or the highs that people know, or they allow, allow hemp and things of that type. Then you'll see the gray, these do not, there's four states listed that have no public access at all. So you can see some form of, of um, medicinal cannabis or recreational or some variation is allowed throughout the country. Again, this map is changing really rapidly and I think you'll be seeing more of the dark colors with allowance of adult and medical use across the country in the coming years. Go to the, okay, so on the next slide we're talking about what are the differences among state governments. I think the key point is that each state has its own regulatory structure and, and tax fee structures or allowances for local authority and regulation. And again, as I mentioned before, it does conflict with federal government. So, so far it's kind of been a hands-off approach from the federal government, but each, you know, each state has its own regulatory processes in place and different philosophies. Um, and I think what we the services we provide do provide are based on a fact that there is not a one size fit all model. Every jurisdiction, every state has to look at it differently and there are different components. Um, 
And so what's happening in California is very different from Oklahoma, for example, where in California, local governments can determine if any product is allowed to be sold in a dispensary or a manufacturer in places like that versus Oklahoma, where it's run by the state and commerce is allowed in all jurisdictions and locals have a limited amount of control. So that's just one example. Um, there is various differences state to state. We're in a position to help each place tailor services and products to their needs based on the state laws and the local preferences. Fantastic. So Fran, your point about the federal government still classifying cannabis as illegal, it, it, for me, is especially notable. Um, Larry, can you welcome Larry, first of all, and Larry, can you take us into, like, how can an industry develop in that environment? Uh, yeah, thank you, Brennan. Um, basically, uh, what we've seen in California is initially an early uh, medicinal um, cannabis industry that started way back in, in, I think, in the early 2000s, where um, initially it was very few business operators, very few uh, cities or counties that allowed the operation of that industry. So the industry at that point was basically looking and, and very accepting of very strict and sometimes onerous requirements to operate within that, that jurisdiction. They were willing to pay high fees, high taxes, um, and uh, other issues that impacted the industry. And also the industry itself was very, um, I don't want to say uh, inconsistent as far as their um, professionalism as far as how they operated. So there were a lot of issues and at the state level where we were the, the, the agency that I was working at was the only agency that oversaw the industry and from this, uh, and it was only from a, a tax standpoint to make sure that they were reporting the, the proper uh, state sales and use taxes on their sales. But in that capacity, we saw a lot of variation as far as the professionalism, how the businesses operated, um, how they kept their books and records. And so it was very uh, difficult to evaluate and oversee these, these industries. Uh, when California went with Prop Decision 64 past that and became a, a more a legalized uh, operation, it became much more uh, of an oversight at the state level and also at the local uh, level. So basically what we've seen over the last uh, 10 or 15 years and, and, and more notably probably in the last few years is that the businesses have become more sophisticated in their operations. Um, there's a lot more funding coming into the businesses to provide resources, to hire CPAs and accountants and lobbyists and, and uh, become more of a professional operation. I um, mentioned there's, there's also more political activism that we've seen in the state over the last Year than we've, in the last two years probably than we've seen in the last 10 or 15 years where they're coming in and lobbying the, the state legislature and even the local governments to, um, to benefit their, their business operations, which um, in some cases can impact both the state and the local operations also. Um, they've also expanded their product types. Uh, initially, basically, you could only buy the raw product for, for smoking uh, uh, as far as the, the, the cannabis industry. In the, now if you walk into an operation, there's uh, hundreds of different types of products that can be purchased anywhere from, from the, the consumables, the, the food items, uh, liquids, um, to the, the vape tinctures, to the, the oils and the, the rubs that can be used within the, um, uh, for various different uh, reasons, whether medicinal or recreational. And then production innovation, that's always changing as far as how they're actually developing and manufacturing the operations. And so that's where it's, it becomes important to make sure that local governments and the state governments uh, stay on top of those type of activities to make sure that they're um, maintaining their responsibilities and their requirements with regard to the industry um, to make sure that it's a, a safe environment and, and continues to be a, a good business partner for the communities. And going on to that, so what we're providing is what we found when we first started working in California and some of the other jurisdictions is meeting with a going out and talking to the various different communities and the uh, uh, city councils or state representatives is that a lot of the, uh, the individuals did not know what the business looked like in its current form. As I said earlier, the uh, industry in the last five, ten years has changed dramatically from dark, uh, uh, very uh, dingy type operations that were uh, 
in areas that weren't very uh, probably the best places to go. And um, so what we're trying to show here with this slide is, there, is that this is sort of a typical retail operation now. And it looks just like a, a, a high-end uh, market or business where you walk in. Uh, in California, there are requirements that not when you come into this facility, you have to go through sort of a secured checkpoint where you have to go through a, a one door, and then there's usually a security guard there that check your ID to make sure that you're legally able to be there. And then you go into the actual sales room, and sometimes there's a limit as far as how many people can be in the sales floor at the, at the at a time, but basically it's just a, an open environment. It's well lit. It's uh, the signage can can vary. Some cities and jurisdictions allow signage on front. Some don't. So um, it just varies. But basically, it's 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 a very um, well maintained and uh, welcoming environment for the product. Um, this next slide shows it gives you an idea of what a, a manufacturing facility would look like. Uh, some of these photos came out of a uh, manufacturing facility in Santa Rosa, California, and where they basically have an extraction, the middle uh, photo with the tall canisters or extraction devices that basically use um, uh, inert or sometimes volatile gases to basically they push through those to compress that to pull the oils out of the cannabis, which you can see on the, the bottom left is that dark uh, brown colored uh, material that they in turn use to uh, make candies and various different edibles as you can see in the top uh, pictures with the, uh, the very stainless steel equipment and then the clean room type facilities and then there's a photo of like the uh, various different oils or uh, uh, types of products that come out of that manufacturing facility. But again, it's a very clean, well-maintained uh, operation. Cultivation, these are providing uh, photos of a, a standard indoor cultivation facility. Um, basically, it's a big giant warehouse or it could be a big greenhouse facility um, with uh, various different lighting requirements. And uh, again, we've talked about the product, product innovation. Um, the, the new cannabis cultivators are getting very good at utilizing very different types of operations and lighting and watering and uh, different processes to, to ensure that they uh, develop the, the most um, uh, the best product that they can. There's also uh, requirements on air filtration on cultivation where um, uh, generally that's the biggest complaint is the odor from the plant, but the air filtration systems are, are built up where uh, you should not uh, smell anything outside that. If you walk around the outside of that building, there should be no odor from the cannabis um, operation. Testing is another component, um, and that can vary by, from uh, state to state. California requires that prior to any product being uh, distributed to the retail operation, it has to go through a distribution facility, and from that distribution facility, samples are taken from the product and sent to a testing facility uh, to test for a number of different uh, contaminants and uh, chemicals and other uh, components to make sure that the products that are being sent to the retail operation are clean and safe for the consumer. And again, that's another segment of the cannabis uh, industry that is licensed separately in California and uh, is monitored at the state level to ensure that, uh, that, that the consumers are receiving safe and healthy products. And delivery is, is sort of the, one of the uh, separate components that uh, can be uh, included in the industry. In California, they, the, the van you see there with the sign on it is not allowed in California. It has to be nondescript vehicles, so people aren't billboarding their, their cannabis operations, but that, will, again, will vary from state to state. But that's an area that um, will, uh, is, a, is a big component of the industry for both the medicinal and the recreational um, component. For the medicinal, there's a lot of uh, concern that makes sure that the, the patients have an access to their their medicines, whether they can leave the house or not. And sort of the last part of the, the industry that, uh, again, may depend on the various different requirements of the state and the local jurisdictions is personal cultivation. In California, as part of the Prop 64 uh, passage, it allows up to six plants to be grown in a residential facility um, for personal use. Um, 
And it's the, the state level allows that six plants, but they also allow the local communities to determine whether they would allow those six plants to be grown outdoors or indoors. And so that's a various different uh, uh, requirement depending on um, the desires of the community. They do allow the, the locals to uh, impose permitting requirements. They can't be undue or unreasonable permitting requirements because they can't uh, totally ban the personal cultivation, but they can also look at things like lighting, make sure that they have uh, safety components because you don't want somebody uh, overloading their, their circuits and things to catch fires, uh, no generators, no fuel storage, um, no extraction or ventilation needs, and then they can inspect it if, they, if there are complaints with regard to that personal cultivation. So just to jump in for a moment on this, so Larry's covered several of the key areas of the industry, and as we go forward, and we'll talk about some of the pioneering work we've done to help jurisdictions go forward, you have to really determine what is the right mix in your community. A lot of strategy around this goes on based on uh, having similar in different types of these industries closely located together in a cluster. It helps efficiencies. So having a testing lab near grows is very important to test the product, um, et cetera, et cetera. So as we talk about these things, what is the right fit for your community in terms of this? Do we just want to sell? Do we just want to have manufacturing or cultivation? These are very important considerations. Um, as you look towards the future in, in implementing cannabis operations in your community. Okay, then the other big issue that we, we hear a lot about is the uh, ripple effects in the, in the health and safety components of, uh, of uh, introducing the cannabis industry into your local jurisdictions. And uh, again, there are some requirements that uh, are mandated at the state level that the locals will have to uh, utilize. So, like, like I mentioned, that there will be cannabis in every community, whether it's actually a commercial cannabis uh, allowance in California, but because of the personal cultivation and the consumption rules have been changed, so um, you cannot have a community that, that basically has no cannabis. So one of the things that, the, that we always take into consideration is the health effects, and that's basically something that has to be uh, done as part of the evaluation and review process, like Fran mentioned, as far as what's good for the community. And that includes the public consumption, intoxication, and driving. Currently, there is no um, like a, a DUI test for cannabis, like a breathalyzer. There are things in process and being, being tested, but there are no uh, specific certain levels that you can blow into or, or blood test that would, would determine um, a, a incapacity with regard to consumption of cannabis. Um, looking at housing and cooperatives, awareness of prevention programs, and crime potential, because as, as Fran mentioned before, the cash industry is an issue, a uh, concern. And then the, the waste from certain components of the, of the industry as far as making sure that that's handled properly and not ha uh, creating a nuisance for the community. Awesome. Well, th thanks, Larry. That's incredible insight in, in, in going over the industry itself. Um, Fran, let, let's shift gears here just for a second and talk, about, talk a little bit about a pioneering state that we've obviously had a lot of experience in in California and some of the ongoing effects of their early adoption and the regulation there. So, so first, just to, to lead it off, each city or county must have a plan that addresses all these economic areas in the previous slides that we've talked about. Karen, let's talk about the issues that communities need to consider. Sure. Now, and I think, you know, as I've said before, and I'll, I'll keep stressing it because I think it's so important, there is no one-size-fits-all. Every community is really going to have to determine what types of businesses to allow in, the numbers, the locations, what really fits in the lifestyle and the landscape of your city. Um, so as you can see on this next slide, when we work with communities, these are some of the very important questions that need to be considered, and we certainly encourage community input, um, community workshops to get public um, input so there's consensus as you go forward, because these can be very difficult decisions in a community, and there will be different views about it. So first and foremost, does your community want to ban or authorize commercial cannabis? And in some states, there is no choice. In others, you do have that choice. So it's going to vary from place to place. But if you have the ability to ban or authorize, what is the right mix? Then if, to that next point, what is the number and size of each business category? Do you want two dispensaries? Do you want four? We've worked with communities that have, you know, have 50 to 60 dispensaries. We've worked in communities where it's one or two. Um, are there acceptable areas? for these business types to operate. In many places, there's setback requirements around schools, churches, um, places of worship, things of that type. Um, it, do, are they fitting into a neighborhood? Do they need to be in an industrial area? What are the acceptable areas 
to allow the businesses to operate. And then, of course, tied to all this, what are the fees and or taxes that the community would support? Yeah, there has to be a very good balance. Um, California, we've had challenges around the high taxes and fees related because, as an example, there's a high excise tax. When you start adding on the local fees and taxes, you get up in 25 to 30 even more percentages. Where's the tipping point where you're overtaxing it and forcing people to go into the illicit market? You're trying to get a balance where you're not overtaxing it, but where you're encouraging people to get out of the black market to be in compliance because you're, you're going to have cannabis operations in your community whether you authorize them or not. It seems to me it's best to have it legalized and done in a fair and balanced measure. So what's the right amount of tax uh, that your community might support? And then who are the key constituencies and stakeholders that need to weigh in? And I think clearly it has to be, you know, people from schools and worship and seniors. There's a very important to have build in consensus from these different groups as you go forward in this area. And then, you know, in terms of planning, if you're, you're going forward, you really have to under, have an understanding of what's already taking place in your community and region, not just your own city, but what's happening in surrounding communities. Are there dispensaries or other operations close by? What would be the right mix? You're competing not just within your own community, but with the surrounding community. What's the right balance? What are the things, the lessons learned, what, it's, what has gone well, what has not gone well in other communities? And that kind of ties into the point of data collection and interpretation. You know, really need to do some economic analysis. What type of potential revenue would come in? Um, market and demand studies are things that have been done or could be done to help you quantify the market so you would have a fair and balanced uh, approach. Um, then, of course, you're going to have to put in resources towards uh, permitting requirements and regulations. Um, what are the requirements that you would have on a business coming in? No different than any other operation that might come in to build a facility, whether it's a manufacturing or a retail store. There's permitting requirements that need to be uh, put in place. Um, and then what kind of sites would really work in your community? If you're going to have setbacks, say, 300 to 600 feet away from a particular type of uh, church or school, what are the real sites that are available in your community um, where your zoning will allow the cannabis industry is certainly something that's very, you know, very controversial potentially um, with people if it doesn't fit in their next backyard. There's a NIMBYism thing, but there has to be a balanced location um, for these type of operations. And then in your, some states would require a voter approved excise tax. And so in California, for example, any tax has to be approved by the voters if it's a separate business license tax and things like that. So that's going to also vary from state to state. And I just want to expand on something Fran mentioned about the setbacks and zoning. Just to give you an example, in California, um, the state set a requirement of 200 feet from sensitive areas, which includes, like Fran mentioned, schools and uh, K through K through 12 and and uh, different types of business operations. But it did allow the cities and counties in California to modify those setbacks. And so we've had some cities that have gone down to basically zero in some areas because they want to have some of the retail locations and different areas. The other issue is is that different industries re may require different setbacks. So like a retailer might have a larger setback where like a manufacturer or a testing lab or distri distribution center where you're not going to have that outside visual impact of the cannabis industry might have a, a, a lesser setback. And some cities have actually gone with uh, higher setbacks of 1,000 feet. So it just depends. Again, it, it's, it's very uh, specific for the, the, the jurisdiction. And I think in addition to getting the community input and getting a sense, you really have to look at the workload of your current city staff or county staff or district staff. Um, do, do we have resources in place to, uh, to work on the planning? To, do we have code enforcement to do inspections once facilities go in place? Um, those types. Of so, um, you know, also we need to talk about the audits and those types of things as well. So. So this next slide kind of looks at the process. I think these are important things to consider as well, and these are areas where we've been helpful to, uh, to jurisdictions. And I think what we really want to do with this is kind of describe how they interact. Um, you know, first of all, we talked about revenue. We need to get a sense of what kind of potential revenue might come in. Does it make sense to go forward? Um, what are the potential revenues under various scenarios? If we had two dispensaries or four, if we had a mixture with manufacturing and other things. Um, we need to have an educational component to reach out to the constituent groups in your community. They need to understand how this may work, what are the risks, 
we need to talk about public safety, youth prevention, um, that, and things of that nature. And of course, if you're going to go forward, you would need to have audits take, take place in order to uh, make sure that everybody's paying their fair amount of taxes. You need to set those expectations on the front end with businesses as well. And then within resources of, the, of your own city or county, you would need to look at what kind of resources will we need to expend, what are the costs that it might take for code enforcement, for public safety, whether it's police or fire, things of that nature, um, how many hours, and we help communities with those kind of estimates as well. Then you also have to continually look at what's happening on the state, local, and federal level in terms of regulations and legislative activity, what's taking place that might change. In California, for example, um, recently delivery of products from the other communities into communities was, has passed, so it's changed the dynamic of local control, and what does that mean to us as a, as a community. And then when you go through the process, you need to be very sure that if you're opening up bids, that it's a fair and a transparent process. You have to have very specific evaluation criteria in there. You have to be very clear to potential bidders who want to come in what that might look like, how the selection process might work um, to make sure it's fair and equitable for everyone involved. And irregardless of whether you want to go forward and to allow any type of cannabis operation or not, you need to make sure your ordinances re reflect the, uh, the desire of your community. Many, we've worked with many communities who are not in favor of going forward with cannabis, so we've helped them to make sure that their ordinances reflect um, that type of uh, activity as well. And then, of course, there's the ongoing administration and compliance, which kind of is the spoke um, in the, the center of the, the wheel here. So there's a lot of interactions that take place uh, throughout this process. Awesome. So, again, let's transition just a, just a moment here, Fran and Larry, and, you know, you guys have done a fantastic job in giving us updates on the industry, ripple effects as the industry itself evolves. We took a look at a pioneering state in California and our experiences there. We've talked planning. We've talked process. Now let's move a little bit deeper into the outcomes, the recommendations and implementation sort of phase. So. What we've done is we've put together a decision matrix here that really sums up the experiences that uh, we've had with our, our current clients. Um, so, Fran, can you dive in here and describe our thought process behind this and how, how those on the phone more specifically can benefit from this sort of approach? Yeah, sure. And, and this, this graph here that's before us is something we've used in community meetings that we've done on behalf of clients where, in one example, the city met in four – four different regions in a particular community um, to make sure all areas of the city were represented. And part of it was even with dots on a wall type of matrix to, to get feedback from folks. So does, does your community support the delivery of cannabis products into your community, or would they, have a, would they favor dispensaries, testing labs, manufacturing, indoor or outdoor cultivation, as you see above, yes or no? And so we've kind of done, built some con community consensus to that. Um, the next one talks about classification. Would you be supportive of medicinal use uh, operations or would you be in favor of recreational or both? Some communities may allow one or the other depending on where they are in their particular state. So this is pulled uh, directly from some of those grassroots meetings with communities. Um, is there property available to have grows? If so, does that mean indoor grows in a warehouse or is there agricultural land that might be available and something you might like to see? Um, Distribution, that could be very similar to a warehouse operation. Does that fit into the, the lifestyle and the landscape of your community? And then does your city council uh, formally approve any of the categories that you see here? And again, this one's built more towards the California and some of the West Coast states that are uh, allowing it, but these are things as we go into other places that may need to be considered as well. Yes, and this is uh, just one thing that we found as we were going through working with the cities and counties, as Brian mentioned, we. We were sort of, we didn't develop a cannabis, cannabis program to go out and do this. We basically were asked by a lot of our clients here in California, what do we do now that cannabis comes, is, is legal in, in California? So one of the things we found is going through um, the process is some of the city's, city council members and even some of the community groups wanted a, a good visual just sort of representation to just sort of boil it down to these very basic points because they were getting lost in a lot of the, the different uh, issues that came up with the industry. So this is very helpful with some of the groups we met with, basically just to break it down into the various different categories, because we did have some cities that say, oh, we wanted to have a large manufacturing facility or a number of retailers or dispensaries, 
But then when we actually went to look at their zoning maps and their, and their zoning setbacks and, and from sensitive areas, it determined that they didn't have any suitable property available for a large manufacturing plant. So operations, so the issue was before you got that far down the road, you had to a, uh, answer some basic questions to basically see what you could actually do before you spent a lot of resources and costs trying to evaluate a uh, industry that you may not be able to accommodate. Great. So, Fran or Larry, can you guys talk to a little bit here about uh, how important it is to communicate and, and pair and, and work together with the right partners within their jurisdiction? Sure. No, I think that's a very important uh, point. And, you know, looking here at the title, we call it pairing with the right partners. I think that's both internally as well as externally. I mean, you know, you really need to have your planning and code enforcement uh, departments in communication and in, in, in partnership with economic development, finance, police, and the uh, city attorney, public health, and utilities. Um, and I think that also includes the state. I mean, that, that's a really big partner in a lot of this because the state laws drive a lot of this. So you're having to touch and communicate with many groups. Um, in one case, we're working with a city where all these departments very much are in sync and working closely together. They've been a part of the process from day one, and I think it's going smoothly because it's ensuring that the right kind of businesses are operating smoothly in, a, in your community. The question, but if you don't have all the resources within these departments, if they're stretched thin, you know, that's part of how others such as ourselves have been able to help to be an extension of staff to fill some of these capacities um, or to address the concerns. Certainly not, we're not public safety officials, but we can help factor in those concerns or help build programs. So having the right internal partners, external partners, as well as with the state governments is incredibly important. I mean, Larry, if you'd like to add a little bit more. Well, I think the other thing we found is, is sometimes coming into a new jurisdiction, or, um, it's overwhelming. So everybody's looking at all the different various different departments we have listed there are, are, are sometimes going out on their own and talking to their, uh, their um, agencies in other cities and, and, and counties to see what they've done. And so one thing I think that we can help based on our experience is sort of focus them and and give them the information to sort of focus them in more on what, what directly they need to focus on and what's going to, what the impacts are going to be to them. Because like we mentioned before with that, with that table, there's so much information out there and a lot of people get overwhelmed with what they should be looking at, what they should be considering, and where they should be focusing their resources. And I think one thing we can help with is, is sort of give them some direction on, on the various different departments, like friends that we're not public safety officers, but we can definitely work with the police and the fire to sort of focus on them on certain areas and issues and concerns that they will be addressing and have to uh, take into consideration as they move forward as far as what, how, how much enforcement, how much evaluation, how much inspections, and what that looks like compared to um, if they just looked at it on their own. Awesome. Okay. So lastly, as we, uh, we move into the final stage of the presentation today, um, Larry, can you take us through uh, the next couple of slides uh, on the areas and summarize what jurisdictions need to know as they craft and ultimately implement a cannabis strategy for themselves or, or advise with a partner or choose a partner? What, what do they need to know as they craft, they craft these, these implementations? Sure. Um, this first slide basically says, what do they want? So we're looking at this for both from both the community and the business side because we do want to make sure that if the industry is allowed or, or, or encouraged into the, into the local community, you want to make sure that you have the best business partners that you can have. And we've talked about that a little bit. But basically, going through what they're like, like any other business, the cannabis business, they want profitability. They want to make, they want to make a living after it. Um, they want to eliminate the illegal market because currently right now, there's illegal cannabis in every jurisdiction within the country. And the idea is if we have a, a, a good feasible uh, commercial market, that should start eliminating the black market. Uh, they want low taxes and low crime. They want to have fair and equitable treatment, just like operate like any other business within the jurisdiction. They want to be able to uh, identify and, and utilize dependable and trained workforce uh, within the community. And they also want to be acceptance, uh, acceptance in the community. Um, a lot of the industries that we're working with and the businesses, um, they want to be good business partners. So they're, they're part of the Chamber of Commerce. They're providing volunteer services. They're working with the community. Some of the... Um, uh, cities that we've worked with incorporate that into the selection process that Fran mentioned before to, to 
to see what they've done in the past if they've operated businesses, other types of businesses, how they've interacted with the community, and what they will plan to do in the future. As, the, as far as the community, they're always looking for revenue, although um, we also um, look at this as a new industry, evolving industry, so that's, a, that's a sort of a, an area that uh, we'll, we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, public health and safety, they want to make sure that uh, the cannabis is being utilized appropriately and not getting into the wrong hands. Um, uh, provide access to medicinal cannabis, that's a big issue for a number of the states as you saw on that earlier map where basically making sure that people have access to cannabis, especially with the opioid um, issues. Um, there's um, some anecdotal evidence basically indicating that cannabis might be a, a good alternative to the opioids. Um, education and, youth, and outreach for the youth uh, to make sure that uh, cannabis isn't, get, isn't getting into the minors' hands and that they, there's some good educational information out there to make sure that uh, they, they wait until they're the appropriate age to uh, utilize the product. Correct. And I think this slide really, to sum it up, Larry did a great job highlighting it. There has to be a fair and balanced approach to this and a true partnership between the business community and the local government. And it, when that is in place, it, it, this goes very, very well and it works mutually beneficial. We have to be very careful not to be too draconian in the approach and the impacts on the business community, uh, yet they have to be held as accountable citizens. And then factoring in, again, the underground economy, we want to gear people towards the business side of it so we eliminate that, and that's in the best interest of, of, of good actors, uh, meaning businesses that are in compliance as well as for the community. Okay, the revenue issues is um, we're talking about um, just an over thing issue with um, the various different areas that might impact the revenues that are they're achieved by the local jurisdiction. And that comes back to the customer dem demographics. So what kind of uh, consumption will be used? What kind of products will be or, or consumed in your jurisdictions? As Fran mentioned before, it's the, the number, type, and size of the businesses. You want to look at the, the factors as far as do you have too many or, or not enough, and if, is there enough uh, uh, product available for those businesses? Um, as I mentioned, there's the product selection is, is the amount of different types of products have increased substantially over the years. And so depending on the jurisdictions, there's going to be uh, certain products are going to be more, more um, popular in different areas. Uh, more of a touristy area might have uh, uh, more of a, a need for uh, manufactured or consumable type products like the chocolates or the edibles, those type of things compared to other areas. Uh, customer loyalty, adequate supply chain, and competition. So again, this, the revenues go back to like Fran mentioned, if the business is, is operating professionally, and well, then they should be able to compete. If not, then their revenue is going to be impacted, and that goes back to making sure that the local jurisdiction selects the, the, the best business partner to operate within their jurisdiction. Right. And I think it's important in kind of coming to a close that we're available, you know, to help in all these service areas that we talked about today, utilizing our team um, to be a resource, again, an extension of your, your staff, you know, including things like educational pr presentations to local staff, elected officials, um, coordinate community f workshops, um, you know, helping you with your pricing, your selection, your auditing, and these things. Um, we, had, we have a pretty good understanding of the overall impact. So if you're going forward for the first time, my best piece of advice is to do your homework, do your research, um, get a good understanding of what your community wants and needs, um, and trust your gut, and I think you'll make good informed decisions. If you're in a situation where it's coming to you, you're not sure what to do with it because it's not your choice. Um, we have, we'd be happy to have conversations around that um, as well. Um, so I think we're, you know, those are all important things to talk about. So, I, yeah, so there's, you know, some, so to that point, here's some of the in, initial considerations. You know, try to get an understanding of what the cannabis industry is and understand that it's changing rapidly. It's changing day by day. New people are coming in. Again, get a, get a sense of what's really acceptable in your community. What may be the concerns or issues to, in your community? Um, we call this Cannabis 101, and this is some, one of the initial services we, we normally provide people with. Um, and that includes identifying unique issues or characteristics of your community. So if you're a, a, a beach town, for example, and you don't really have a lot of big box retail, how would retail fit into your community? Um, how does that blend in and not contrast with what you're doing? Um, if you're more of an industrial city, you may have an interest in distribution or manufacturing. Would that make sense in your warehouse district? So it blends in with current businesses, things of that type. Um, 
then again, evaluating your resources in terms of uh, your ability to administer audit uh, process cash, which is a big portion of this that uh, Larry spoke about as well, and then how rig rigorous does your regulatory structure really need to be? Um, and again, these are areas of importance that we would be available to help you with. So, so thank, thank you. Awesome, awesome. Thank you both. Um, this has been very insightful. Um, let's let's shift here um, and move into some question and answer period. And we do have some questions rolling in now um, that I'd like to start start going going through, Fran and Larry, if that's okay with you guys. Okay, um, great. We've got we've got a couple of government regulations. We got some banking and um, some specific solutions questions. So, for, first one that came through was: Has the federal government taken any action against any businesses or local governments for operating cannabis businesses? Um, in my experience, uh, working for this, the state of California for um, uh, since 2003 on cannabis, I can say that we haven't had any, um, in, 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 and over those years, we've had various different administrations and various different attorney generals at the federal level. So we've had various different ups and downs with regard to uh, the federal oversight of, of the industry. Uh, but for the most part, we haven't seen anybody, in, any uh, federal uh, activity against um, uh, businesses or the state or any local jurisdictions. I, I'd have to comment back in the uh, 2009, I think there was some issues or 2008 where they had some issues where the, the cannabis industries were using bank accounts and the federal government did see some deposits that were being made to the state of California for, for tax purposes. Um, I think that was the only impact that we've seen. The federal, the federal uh, government and local governments and states still do pursue the black market or the illegal market activities, and so they are pursuing that. But as far as legal operations, we haven't had any issues with it, uh, for cities or counties or at the state with regard to the federal government. Awesome. Okay. Uh, more, more on the economic effects um, side of the fence here. So we've got, are there any trends that have begun to emerge from more experienced communities in terms of how marijuana establishments have affected different types of settings, for example, downtowns, strip developments, industrial parks, et cetera. More specifically, how has this affected property values, in your opinion, whether businesses have located near these establishments or been pushed away? Well, just uh, uh, overall, um, it varies from city to city, local jurisdictions, because the, like we mentioned before, in California, the cities have the ability to determine where those businesses will be located. Um, one of the interesting economic impacts we have seen is that the property values in, in areas where the, the industry is looking to, to, um, to locate have increased significantly because of the uh, people looking at, at this as, as people looking at cannabis as a, as a new and emerging market. and so. Um, one of the things we have actually had to tell some of the communities that if they are looking at allowing the industry to come in, that their uh, property values in some of these areas will go up and can also, it would, could negatively impact other types of industries that are trying to oper uh, locate in that city that aren't cannabis related. So it's sort of a, a different type of thing. We haven't seen where the property values or things have decreased because of the uh, uh, the, the allowance of cannabis industry into the cities. Right, and just to add to it, you know, I think it's been fascinating to watch as we've worked with cities that are going through the application process. You know, normally someone who's applying to a city has a location in mind, they've secured a location, and they, they've really tried to complement the community around them. I think it's been in, in most places with retail, especially because they're all high end, as you saw in the pictures earlier, they've really complemented the core where they are located if they're in a downtown and it has to blend in. So I think it's had a positive impact in that respect. Um, and then the locations where we've seen it out in more industrial areas, I think it's worked out well because it may go into an area that's not trafficked as much, um, and I think it's benefited as well. So I think that really gets into the planning and zoning, but in generally it's been a boom to the areas it's gone into, provided that it fits and blends in with the current makeup of the portion of the community that it may be located in. Right, we have had some like uh, very, like in, uh, in the wine country in Napa Valley where it's very touristy and they have some very small and like downtown squares and retail areas where it's basically shops and restaurants. Um, there has been some um, uh, issues where, not, not issues, but basically the city has determined that they didn't want the retail locations to be in that downtown 
retail core area, but have allowed them in in some of the outlying areas. So it just depends on the city and the and the the makeup and the demographics and what they what they want to see out of their city as they move forward. Excellent, excellent. Okay, pretty straightforward here. Are there examples of cities that allow clustering? If so, how has it been working in your opinion? Yes, there are, that's a great question. Yeah, there have been example, excellent examples of clustering um, that has worked well. Um, one, since we're here in Sacramento, Davis, California, just down the road from us, has clustered businesses together and it's blended well. There's a lot of community involvement, uh, staff work. Um, clustering has worked extremely well in that particular case. Yeah, I think for, for smaller cities it works out because you don't have a lot of area for them to go into and basically with the, and it depends on the type of industry that you're allowing. If you're uh, the clustering of like manufacturing and distribution and testing where you don't have that outside outward appearance of the industry, uh, we don't think that's an issue at all because for the most part the, the manu the, those type of facilities as you as you come up to visit them or see them, you don't even know they're there. They're like any other industrial uh, business in that in that industrial park or somewhere else. So that doesn't seem to be an issue. Where it becomes a bigger issue is like the the retailer where the outward appearance, but so a larger city um, tends to spread them out a, a little more because then that gives them a more access throughout the the community compared to putting them in all, all in one place where um, there it's, it's harder for people to get to or, or, or uh, commute to. Excellent. Okay. Another one just came in, um, more of a comment than a question. This is great insight and guidance. Avenue is clearly knowledgeable uh, and ahead when it comes to regulation and program implementation. First off, thank you for that comment. Secondly, what specific solution does Avenue provide and how are they structured? Um, specific solutions? I think, well, it really, again, I go back to the one size fits all model there is none so yeah I mean I think what we the answer is we can help a community from the beginning to end throughout the entire process just you know defining what it might what you might want to do um, what the ideal would look what's going on in the surrounding communities to help you define that so there has to be a look at the entirety of the process I think is the best way to put it well, basically what we're trying to say is we've, we've done it uh, since we started here in California in the last uh, three or, or more years, we've had various different scenarios and we've basically come into some communities where we've started from the beginning, uh, evaluation and review phase all the way through the, the full implementation of assigning licenses and actually working with them on the collection process and then to the audit component. But we've also been called in in various different stages where the cities have have, are, are starting, so we'll start with some cities where they're looking at the uh, uh, evaluation or review process, and then basically we get to the point where the city council decided they were going to ban it, so we got them through that process, and then we helped them with their regulatory, their ordinances to ensure that when they did ban it, they did it properly, so um, there wouldn't have any impact um, to the community. Um, we've also come in at the work with cities that have started the process and then ran into some some issues and some concerns, and so we've come through and, and, and helped them through the process. Um, uh, to, to address that specific situation or continued on as we move forward. So basically what we're trying to say is, is we don't really have a one size or a set package, we just have an overview, over, um, overview of all the various different areas and issues and we can help the, the, the community with any one of those components. Yeah, and we're getting a lot more interest in helping cities now with the full administration of the cannabis process, collecting and remitting the licenses and, and those types of things. So. I think as it evolves, we're, we're in a good position to help a, a jurisdiction throughout the entire process, whether we begin at the beginning or pick up partway through. We've recently worked with a jurisdiction that absolutely had no interest in allowing cannabis operations um, come back a year later and say, now we want to go forward. What do we do now that we have a different view about this? And so we've been able to help chart that course as well. Right. And one, and one area just specifically we talked about is the cash handling. There's a, a lot of issues and, and considerations the jurisdiction must uh, take in, must, must uh, address if they're going to be receiving large amounts of cash. So like if a payment comes in $30,000, $100,000 and they get a big bag of cash, how are they going to handle that? So that's one area we've, we've been working with a lot of our jurisdictions on how to deal with that situation um, ex ex internally and externally with their banks and their, their other um, um, agencies and external factors with regard to that. So that's a big component that uh, takes a lot of planning and review and uh, processing to get through.
Sure. Okay. We've got a delivery question here. Um, can can you share more information on how delivery on how delivery only services have been operating? For instance, do they need business licenses in each city? And do they have to deliver to actual addresses or can they deliver to a park, et cetera? Okay, and that goes back to the various different jurisdictions are going to have different uh, requirements. And I can speak for California because we've been dealing with that. So uh, previously, deliveries were um, um, allowed are, are allowed throughout the, the, the deliveries are allowed throughout the state. And as far as the state level, the state level put requirements on delivery operators and California delivery operators cannot be freelance. They have to be associated with an actual retail operation. They have to maintain all the records and, and information in the vehicle and electronically back at the, at the, at the business location. They can, they're limited as far as the amount of cash and product they can carry. They have to drive in nondescript vehicles. They can only deliver to a, a, a home address, an actual street address, and they can only operate on public roads. So they can't go into private property or, or private roads, such as maybe like a national park type things or other non-public uh, non roads. Um, the, the, all that information is, is captured and maintained at the business level. It can be reviewed at any time. Um, for audit purposes and for enforcement purposes, they can be stopped. They can be. Uh, they can do like the the, the, the undercover operations where they uh, the, the law enforcement may make an order, and then when they show up, they can verify and validate all their their paperwork and their information to make sure that they're uh, operating at the state level. And then also, this the local levels can impose some additional requirements as far as deliveries. One thing that Fran mentioned in, in California previously. Uh, our understanding of the statute was that deliveries could be uh, registered and limited by the, the, uh, the, the local jurisdiction could limit deliveries from being made in their jurisdiction. The state just made a change to that regulation, which basically allows delivery statewide. So now we're working with our, our communities in California to see how they address that because there were some communities that actually licensed specific delivery operations and they got a business license. and and operated within that city like any other business, but now they're going to be, have to be able to allow these outside uh, their jurisdictions licensed businesses to come in. So we're working with the state, going through and evaluating the new regulations, what information we can capture, whether the locals can actually require that business license and impose a tax on that. So um, those are things that we're working through, um, and we have a policy statement going out shortly that ha has some information on that that will go out to our clients in California, but we can also make it available to Brennan to, to, to provide for uh, anybody on the call here today. And I think this is an important question. It's going to get more and more complicated. It's very similar to e-commerce transactions that we see around products, whether it's from, through an Amazon or other online seller selling into a community. Are they collecting and remitting the taxes that are owed, and how does that impact your brick and mortar? Uh, on deliveries from outside communities will have an impact on the retail operations or the businesses that are established in your community. It's a, it's a, different, it's a challenge that has to be addressed and, and factored into your decisions as you go forward. And, and that just ties into something else as far as when we work with our, our local jurisdictions here, we make sure that, they, that whatever they come up with is very flexible and fluid so we, they can make changes to address changes to the industry as it evolves because we know that this is the most current one, but as it moves forward, we mentioned earlier that the industry is becoming more sophisticated at both the state and the local level, and so they're going to be lobbying to, to make changes that, that uh, uh, make it better for them, which also could impact the local jurisdictions, so we're working to make sure that uh, to limit those impacts on local jurisdictions, and so, but there will be changes and there will be things happening in the future that uh, the cities and, and counties and local jurisdictions will have to address, and so um, you don't want something so um, hard and fast that you can't uh, move forward with those changes. Wonderful. Wonderful. Okay. Well, I think that brings us to the end, guys. Um, if, if there are additional questions, we would certainly be happy to answer those. Um, if, if you want to submit those um, to our distribution list, our internal marketing distribution list, and we'll make sure that Fran and Larry um, have some input on those questions and get the answer back out to you um, within 24 hours. So uh, if you have thoughts, comments, 
um, inquiries, um, if you're interested in, you know, having a conversation with our with Larry or Fran about our internal or our cannabis consulting um, solution, please reach out to us. We'd love to hear from you at webinars at avenueinsight.com. Um, again, if you have any questions, please submit those as well. We'd be happy to get back to you. Thanks for your time today. Thank you both, Larry, Fran. Thank you for your time. Uh, wonderful job. Excellent. Um, and we look forward to uh, speaking with many of you again soon. Have a wonderful day. Great. Thank you. Thank you.